Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Fishing for Men with Mac show. Good evening or good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or happy lunchtime, wherever you find yourself and you're listening to this episode. I'm so glad that you could join me again for this show. We are in pod 5 of 11 episodes that is about the 22 reasons to stop believing in God video. So far, I have covered at least eight objections to the belief in God so far. And the issues that we've dealt with so far range from things about free will, about God's omniscience, about why space is so huge and why God couldn't even stop a murder when there were four people on the earth, about how a virgin birth could be possible and how the story of Jesus could be true if there were similar myths before him, how some atheists are better politicians than Christians and how the divisions in Christianity seems to portray a bad picture. And if you want to have any more information on that or you're interested in that, just go check out the, the previous four podcasts. And, and this will also just uh, before I continue, this will be the last advertisement of this. Um, the book that I wrote is, is dated to launch this coming Saturday, the 1st of August uh, by me. It's Thursday evening, the 30th of July. So two days to go. Please go check it out on Amazon. The, the Kindle is ready for pre-order. The paper, paperback you can already purchase if you want it. Um, and so it's, it, it's available already. If you're in South Africa, you can just let me know. I can, I can send you a book. Um, and if you'd like to know more about that book, just wait until Saturday, 6 p.m. Saturday. I'm going to do like a 20-minute talk um, live on YouTube and on, on Facebook. Just check that out. And that's 9 a.m. USA time. And I'll just briefly explain what the book is about. And, and, and the last time, I also want to say this, uh, Podbean, let me know last week that um, this, this podcast has had a thousand downloads. And I just want to thank everybody who listened, who has been listening to this year. Um, I don't do this for me. I do this for the kingdom. And because I want people to to know the truth and i want people who are confused about life to know that there's a reason why they live that there is a god that is living and that the christian worldview is the only way that life makes sense and as i said before maybe you uh, don't listen to all the podcasts that is no problem at all just remember these podcasts are there and we deal with the questions that people have out there and yeah just Refer back to them whenever you come across something that you don't understand or a question is thrown at you that you don't have an answer for. I'm not saying that I've got all the answers, but at least I'm trying to put some some ideas out there to say, look, it's it's not that simple when people say God does not exist. In actual fact, it's it's very hard to prove that Christianity is wrong. It, it's very hard because it's legitimately situated in history. Um, there are writings that are... That, 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 that have just been confirmed over the years, and we're going to talk a bit about that um, on this show. So, for today, we are with Rebuttal 9 and 10 of 22. Uh, here are number 9 and 10 among the reasons why it is a good idea to stop believing in God, according to that video. Okay, number 9. If you ever wrote a book with that many contradictions in it, your publishers would have to pull it from the shelves. I wish I could say it with the same sort of attitude. Number 10, if God made us in his image, why do we have vestigial body parts and organs that often fail? I think these are pretty good um, questions, a little bit more meaty to deal with. Let me start with the first one and let me just repeat it so that your brain juices can start flowing. Um... Here it goes. If you if you ever wrote a book with that many contradictions in it, your publishers would have to pull it from the shelves. Okay, so the first thing that I I want to just talk about briefly is this word contradiction. He says that the Bible has contradictions. I'd like to understand which contradictions he is talking about. Now, I've personally studied the Bible for a long time. I am aware of some of the contradictions that we do find in the Bible. There are a certain text that seems to be contradictory and that seems to carry different information, but they are so minor. They are so small in significance. And even so far that I'm willing to say that 99.9% .9 of the Bible does not contain any contradictions. 
okay? There, there are sometimes small differences in some of the details, but if you look at those details, you come to understand why they are different. Because the Bible has been written by different people. We do not claim that the Bible is like the Quran that fell down of heaven that was written by God. No, the way that we understand the scriptures have been written, and this is what the Bible testifies to itself, is that it is God-breathed. God's breath is in the words. So in other words, the people who wrote down the words, they were human beings, they were people subject to making mistakes, okay? But God breathed and worked through them. So you have, when you look at the Bible, you've got a, you've got a document that is written by both man and God. Okay, and that might sound ridiculous, but look at the cross. Jesus was both man and God, right? That's the way that God works with the human race. So um, let me give a few examples of these differences that we could pick up in the text. Um, like, for example, the name of a place. Okay, let me give you an example. If if I speak to people and I ask them where they come from in South Africa, some of them would say uh, they come from Rhodesia. Now, Rhodesia doesn't exist today. But I do know that it, there's a country uh, that borders to us that used to be Rhodesia, but it's now called Zimbabwe. You see, so in the Bible, you would have one guy talk about Rhodesia and you'd have another guy talk about Zimbabwe. All right, so you, you see the differences that there are? Um, I had a question recently um, about what was written on the cross Jesus was crucified on. My dear brother um, Archibald sent me this question. Uh, listen to this. Matthew, wrote, okay, just for those of you who don't know, we've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who tell the story of Jesus. Okay, And they all recorded some similar stories. Now, Matthew wrote that this, this wooden plaque that was placed on top of Jesus' head, um, on top of the cross as he was crucified, okay, um, had the following written on it. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark said, this is what was written on it. This is the King of the Jews. Luke wrote, the King of the Jews. John wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Do you see how they all differ slightly on what was actually written on this piece of wood on top of the, the, the cross? Now, the question is, who is right? And maybe this is something that seems contradictory to people. The wording is slightly different in all of them. Only John uses the words Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. Um, the question is, do they contradict each other? Is this, is this an example of contradiction? Well, in a way, right? But what do they actually do? I think they also actually prove that it is real. If three guys said... Okay, there was a wooden plank placed above Jesus' head, and one of them said, no, there wasn't. That would be a contradiction, wouldn't it? Or two guys said there wasn't, two guys said there weren't. But all four guys say that there was a wooden uh, plank placed above Jesus' head on the cross. Okay, so to me, this proves more the resurrection, uh, uh, the, the, the crucifixion, than anything else. All right? They did place a wooden plank above his head. And they mocked him for being the king of the Jews. All right? Let me give an example. Okay. You've got four witnesses of the Twin Tower plane crash in New York, right? And each person is going to give the details about exactly this same event. They each witnessed it. They might have a slightly different time it happened. When you ask them, at what time did it happen? They're going to have slight differences in time, right? They, they might have it a little bit wrong as to how many stories up this plane went into the tower, right? But they would all agree that the plane actually did hit the tower. And you're going to believe their testimony of it because all four says the same thing. The point is this, that the plane hit the towers. That is what is important. And in this way, the Bible is 100% accurate over and over again. There might be small differences in some of the stories, but they make no theological impact whatsoever. When the Bible says it is God breathed, it means that the God stuff, the stuff that God actually wants us to focus on and know and understand, there's no contradiction about that whatsoever. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, if the the guys who have each giving a testimony about how the plane uh, flew into the, the Twin Towers and they differ slightly about uh, the time it happened and about how high up in the building it happened and what the sound was like. I mean, you're not going to discredit their testimony because of that, right? It doesn't make their testimony less valid. 
Okay, so because all four of them attested to the core of the main event, um, I reckon it's quite um, truthful. I think it's quite truthful. What about the concurrence? So if we look at the contradictions, which are very minor, I've given you a very good example now. What about the concurrences? What about the similarities that we find in the Bible? And you'll never see atheists actually step back and say, oh my goodness, I see, you know, I don't know how to deal with the fact that there are so many things in the Bible that actually merge together. Different people write about the same thing and it's the same facts. You know, you would hardly ever hear them say that. they'll go to the 0.04% of cases in the Bible where there seems to be um, differences in, in, in the actual event um, and they'd elevate that. But what about the concurrences? What about the fact that from Genesis to Revelation there is uniformity, that the whole Bible is a collection of 66 books written by 40 different people over a span of 1,600 years? Now, I've done this before, but I'm going to do it again for in case you didn't listen last time. Let's put this into a practical explanation. Let's just use four people. One person goes and lives in Iraq. In the year 1100. Another person goes and he lives in Egypt. In the year 1500. Another person goes and he lives in Greece. In the year 1400. Another person goes and lives in Syria. In the year 2020. They each go and they write down a story about something. They they haven't met each other. They haven't spoken to each other. They um, And they write down a story. They live in different times. And they write down, what's the chances that they're going to write something similar? What's the chances that their writings are going to be merging with each other? That, ladies and gentlemen, is almost impossible. That, I would say that is impossible for four people to get that right. Four different people in different times, different places write a similar story. That is the story of the Bible, except we're talking about 40 different people over a period of of 1,600 years. What about the fact that there are more than 6,000 copies of the New Testament scriptures? These were written by different people in different places. Okay, 6,000 copies. And when you compare these copies, listen to this, they are 99.5% exactly the same. This is not just my words. You can go research this yourself. All of these copies are 99.5% the same. Okay, And the places where there are some errors, it is spelling mistakes or minor copyist errors. What about all the discoveries that have confirmed the facts of the Bible? There's not been one archaeological discovery that has contradicted the biblical record. People have tried. Thousands of discoveries have been dug up to support the biblical text. How is it possible to write down a fake document situated in history that does not contradict the discoveries beneath the soil? I mean, if the Bible was made up, I'm sure that sometime or another they would have found something that says, no, the Bible is totally wrong. Okay, let me give you a few examples. I mean, the prophecies of Jesus in the book of Isaiah. I mean, these prophecies were made about Jesus and about what's going to happen on the cross 700 years before it happened. Okay, and so for for a long time, scholars looked at the book of Isaiah because we had copies that was uh, that 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 wasn't that old. That was some of the copies were written after Jesus had lived. And these guys would say, look, I mean, Jesus uh, died on the cross. And obviously somebody went after that and wrote the book of Isaiah and said, look, uh, this is how the uh, Isaiah, the prophet has predicted what would happen on the cross but in actual fact it's already happened so let's just write down a few things that seem like they were prophecies until in the 1940s a young shepherd boy walked into a cave and he found copies he found the dead sea scrolls and he found scrolls that isaiah wrote copies of isaiah's writings okay that dated a thousand years earlier than the writings that we had Okay, so now there was evidence that 700 years before Jesus lived, Isaiah already said that he would die on the cross, that he would be born of a virgin, etc., etc. So every time people criticize the biblical text, God like comes into the picture and he just gives evidence for its um, its reliability. What about the discovery of King Sargon's temple in Assyria? They said this king never lived. 
Okay, then on the banks of, of, of the um, Euphrates River, they dug up his palace. Okay, what about Pontius Pilate? They said he didn't exist. In 1961, they found limestone with his name inscribed on it. In 2018, they found a 2,000-year-old copper ring with his name on it. They believed the Hittites that the Bible speaks about. It wasn't a real a nation. And then in the 19th century, a William Wright found monuments confirming their existence. I, I can go on and on and on. There are thousands of such examples. And another question. If the Bible was so blatantly contradictory, would the human race not have already rejected it like 2,000 years ago? Would we already have said like, look, this is junk. This is just a bunch of rubbish that was written by somebody, right? Surely someone must have seen the errors and thrown it away. The Bible has been hated and burned for thousands of years, yet it has never been destroyed. Today, 3.2 billion people believe in it and trust it. Are they all irrational and incapable of seeing these apparent contradictions? No, there's something special about the Bible. Now, I just want to read you some thoughts that I came across this week that was written. Let me read it to you. A few years ago, H.L. Hastings, in a book entitled, Will the Old Book Stand?, said, The Bible is a book which has been refuted, demolished, overthrown, and exploded um, more times than any other book you have ever heard of. They overthrew the Bible a century ago in Voltaire's time, entirely demolished the whole thing. In less than a hundred years, said Voltaire, it will have been swept from existence and will have passed into history. But, (laughs) here we are, we still have the Bible, man. The Word of God is living and it abides forever, the Bible says of itself. Man cannot destroy the Bible. We might as well put our shoulder to the burning wheel of the sun and try to stop it on its flaming course as attempt to stop the circulation of the Bible. Men have died on the gallows for reading it and have been burned at the stake for owning it. Tortures too fiendish to describe have been visited upon delicate women and tender children for looking on its pages. Yet in spite of the strongest forces that hell could unleash, and in the face of the animosity of tyrants and despots, there are more Bibles in the earth today than there are copies of any other book ever written by the hand of man. The indestructibility of the Bible is proof that its author is divine. I've just written a whole bunch of things that people have written about it. And I wanted to for the show, but I thought I'll leave it for another future show. But if you go look in history, how the Bible has been persecuted, you'll be blown away that it still exists today. And yet it is being printed. It is being sold over and over again. How is it possible that this book can continually live like this and make such a big impact in the world if there was no divine influence. So that's the first point I'll just talk about for today, the first rebuttal um, about the contradictions in the Bible. Let's go to the second one. If God made us in His image, why do we have vestigial body parts and organs that often fail? All right, I I like this question. It's not a um, very deep and difficult one, but... Uh, this question of we're made in God's image, you know, and this is the sad part for me is that, you know, people who criticize Christianity, you know, they don't even know what they're talking about. I mean, really go check out what does it mean to be made in the image of God? I mean, what is this guy assuming? He's assuming that God looks physically like we do or that he has bodies like we do. Being made in God's image has nothing to do with our physical bodies. Okay. God does not look like us. The Bible says that God is spirit. John 4 verse 24. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50 says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. All right? How can we go to God's kingdom in these bodies? 1 Corinthians 15 says that we're going to have different bodies. Okay? He says that there are heavenly bodies and then he says that there are earthly bodies. All right? So we don't have the same body as God. When the Bible says that we are made in God's image, it is about our inner being, about our consciousness, about our ability to love and be loved, and about our moral free will. Okay? It's important to know that. And I think some Christians don't even know that that's what it means to be made in the image of God. And then he talks about, and I think it's maybe important to just talk about this idea of failed bodies. Some people's organs do fail naturally. Some people are are born like Nick Vujicic. He's born without limbs, and 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 you know some people are born with 
you know, with holes in their hearts, for example. And the question is this, if God is perfect and he creates us perfect, why do these things happen? Why is there, why, why do we have people with broken bodies, with misshaped bodies, with biological issues? And um, I would say, well, because of us, because of the human race. And this is where it gets theological. The Bible talks about it and we call it sin. Sin is the thing that creates deformity. Sin is the thing that destroys our world. Sin is the thing that brings about uh, pain in our world. Okay, When Adam and Eve were created, they were perfect and they were going to live forever right until the day they sinned right before that they were going to live forever okay but they sinned you see theologically sin is the cause of our pain and suffering it is like a virus that has infiltrated humanity sin in many ways is doing the unnatural going against the will of god when we do such things it hurts nature and we end up with diseases and deformities etc now i'm not saying that at all if in case that's where your mind is going that people with deformities have sinned okay that's not what i'm saying Okay, I'm saying that there is sin in our genetics. There is sin um, in our in our in our bloodlines. Okay, and the consequences of sin are carried over from one generation to the other, and we carry the consequences of that. And by the way, we all have that in us. That's why we're all going to die. The fact that we don't live forever in these bodies is based on the idea or on the truth that we have sin. Okay, it's a virus that kills us. Okay, so all the deformities that we are born with, that we grow up with, is there because of the free will of our forefathers and what it is that they did. We carry the consequences of that. Now, it's also a complex thing to talk about. Uh, you know, I need more time to, to talk about that and to explain it further. Um, but let that just, let that simmer in your mind. Okay, so let me conclude. I always like to give two um, concluding um, challenges to the atheist community and let me start with the first one science changes so often how sure can you be that its current explanations will be correct a hundred years from now like because science changes the whole time right you complain about the bible being a contradiction yet you believe in scientific understanding that is being rewritten daily scientists are running around every day trying to create new theories trying to create new scientific facts. The biblical text has never been changed or altered for the last 2,000 years. And if you include the Old Testament, you're talking about something that's 3,500 years old. It's never been altered, never been changed, and it is still effective and still is relevant. If you go look at how much science has changed over the last just 100 years, you're going to be blown away. If science grows, develops, and changes with new developments, how can you trust science with your future based on what it says today? What if in a hundred years' time from now, you believe science? You believe science is just no God, whatever you want to believe. A hundred years from now, you are dead. Okay? And then science figures out, oh my goodness, there's actually life after death. Oh my goodness, human beings actually have souls. I mean, how are you going to feel about that then? I mean, so we've got to be careful to put all of our trust in science. Okay. The second question is this. And this is based on a previous podcast I did. I think it was the second one I did. If we come from fish, how did we end up with a laryngeal with laryngeal nerves? And I'd encourage you to go look at that um, podcast to go listen to that one. And it's called Can Fish Speak? Guys, have a fantastic week. Don't do drugs. Love you. And be cool. Cheers.